Hi, this is Paul, and I'm continuing my series on Jordan Peterson's Easter uh, message. That was in five parts. It was a video that he did. And I'm going to bring in a bunch of other videos that have, that have come around lately because actually they're talking about it. So we're going to talk about God and blood sacrifice, God and human sacrifice. Now, it's been a, I would say, even a modernist trope to be very condescending about sacrifice. This is something that um, good colonials and modernists look down upon. This is something that we have evolved beyond to, to imagine. I, I, I get ideas in my head sometimes that I really shouldn't say, and I'm not going to say it, but there they are. To imagine that, you know, that God cares if we sacrifice a chicken, or a goat, or a lamb, or a ram, or an ox. Even though this was ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, cross cultures, cross generations, we have spent more time in this system than we've spent outside of it in terms of human culture. This is how we talk about it. And Peterson... Part three of Peterson's five-part death and resurrection video deals with sacrifice. And I'm going to deal with that again today. I've got some more stuff to talk about. Sacrifice is a really big deal. But I thought it was interesting because in the in the Sam Harris, Bart Ehrman conversation, this the way these two talked about it, and Bart Ehrman should know better, but the way these two talked about it is very typical of the kind of conversations and condescensions you hear. So let's let's have a listen. Dum -da -dum -da -dum. Here we go. Clearly not borne out. I mean, it was when he was talking about reigning on earth at, at some future point, his coming crucifixion isn't a, an insult to that picture? No, it absolutely is an insult to it. And so uh, what I'm saying, I mean, historically, Jesus almost certainly predicted that the end was going to come within his generation. Uh, and the disciples uh, believed he would be the Messiah who would be sitting on the throne. So when he was crucified, that absolutely disabused them of that idea. Uh, and that's why the resurrection is, the belief in the resurrection is, is how Christianity, this, this new idea, starts. Uh, right. the, the new idea being that it's the death and resurrection of Jesus that changes uh, a person's relationship to God, not, not the coming eschaton. I guess another principle here that has always bewildered me morally more than intellectually. And it's this notion that the significance of, of Christ's crucifixion, it is an endorsement of the moral logic of human sacrifice. And human sacrifice is something that has occurred in a wide variety of cultures. And it's, it was just widely believed, almost universally believed that our species lived in perpetual relationship to invisible gods of various sorts who could be propitiated with human sacrifice. And, and then, you know, you, you get animal sacrifice beginning to stand in for human sacrifice in the Old Testament and things like, you know, rituals like circumcision standing in for, you get these more and more attenuated sacrifices. But, but human sacrifice is, is a virtual cultural universal and the logic of Christ dying for our sins and and redeeming them by his sacrifice is the logic of human sacrifice and so it's you know I've thought of Christianity as a in large measure an unwitting cult of human sacrifice it's not that you, it's not that you get some different moral order you just get this doctrine or this mere assertion really that Human sacrifice is indeed important. It's, it is what God wants and requires. It's the whole story morally, but there was only one that was truly necessary, and indeed it was, it was effective. It was accomplished in the life of Jesus. Right. I mean, as, you know, as somebody who's a, a non-Christian looking in, this looks very peculiar indeed and, and fairly ghastly. And the, the logic that you just laid out makes perfect sense to 
people who are not Christians. For people inside Christianity, for some reason, it just, that that logic just doesn't resonate uh, because they just, you know, it, I don't know. They don't connect. They don't connect the dots. But, you know, it it's a kind of a strange world where you think that God requires His Son to be tortured to death so that He can forgive people. Mm. Why can't he just forgive people? I mean, you know, when when my son does something wrong, I don't, you know, tell him I'm going to kill his pet dog in order to make up for it. You know, I just forgive him. That might be really convincing for his son, however. <laughs> so, yeah. but apparently God requires, yeah, doesn't require the death of a dog. He requires the death of a, his own child. And uh, that is... That, you know, the thing is, you know, sophisticated Christian theologians realize that the doctrine of the atonement is the is, is something they just can't get around. I mean, it's just they, they don't have a good explanation for it, uh, but they, you know, they try to. But uh, it's 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 a pretty awful doctrine. And it, it it's among several other points that suggest that the morality of God is something that we would consider evil if it were the morality of a person. It's like, this is what sort of God is it that, I mean, as you said, requires the torture and death of his own son to, to forgive the, the flaws of creatures that he created to be flawed, right? And, when, and what sort of God is it who creates a scheme where the difference between eternal happiness and eternal torment is to be realized by merely believing the right things, but he hasn't given sufficient evidence so as to persuade people to believe the right things. And you have evil people who just by no accomplishment of their own just happen to be indoctrinated into the right things. And you have good people who, despite all of their good works, will spend an eternity in fire because they never heard the gospel. I mean, this whole picture of how souls are damned and saved if it were created by the hand of a person, if this were a psychological experiment that, that, you know, we created and forced others to live through, you know, this would be the most sadistic enterprise imaginable. And yet we're asked to believe that a, a wholly good and compassionate God has set the universe up this way. And, you know, obviously the, the Muslims and other religious adherents play the same game and believe mutually incompatible sets of people will be damned and saved thereby. But the idea that anyone thinks this is the foundation of a truly unimpeachable morality standing outside the tradition, it's very hard to wrap one's head around. Okay, that's pretty much the standard. Um, that's pretty much the standard take. Uh, very well articulated. One, one might ask, however, if the, if the modernist approach is an upgrade given if the modernist approach is an upgrade given the fact that in their system everyone is damned well what do you mean everyone well everyone goes to sleep not everyone is tortured i don't want to get into that food fight right now because i wanted to point to the fact that this is at this moment kind of the common there's a there's there's in a sense a a, a cult there's a there's a kind of a a wisp of a of a 19th century colonial elitism to this argument too it's like oh those primitives and those natives out there doing these things um who could possibly imagine and so you, you very much get this sense of evolution that that well in the 19th century and i've walked through this history in my in my last video or in a number of my videos so you know remember that first in the 19th century you know the history and the history and and scientific value of the bible that was dismissed and the modernists said well we can keep the bible for our ethics then after the cold war the ethics of the bible are dismissed and and now in terms of the the modernists it's the the eighth celebrity atheist modernists i hate when we start hyphenating people together but what other category can we use you know now, now suddenly well well the, all that 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 a whole bible is immoral not only is it worthless in terms of science and history but the whole bible is immoral and and the whole thing ought to be chucked now i thought this was very interesting though because human sacrifice yeah this 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 whole thing's about human sacrifice bart ehrman you know this human sacrifice well, i began to notice stuff coming up in some other videos now this is a little video done by rebel wisdom and they had their part two of the podcast, which had some very interesting Jordan Peterson conversation in. 
I had a lot of thoughts on that, but I didn't make a video. Maybe I will, maybe I won't, I don't know. But then there was this little video with this conversation with Brett Weinstein about people. And and I thought, yeah, and the conversation, again, if you read the if you read the heretic, the uh, uh, a an article that I posted in a number of my videos about Thomas Nagel, and you read, okay, what are we what are we really? We are well, we are we are moist robots. Well, we are moist robots, and we do not have free will. Free will is an illusion that we have. And again, if you read the heretic, you know, the, this this article, well, should we should we let everybody else, should we tell everybody that they're having the illusion of choice, or should we just keep them in the illusion? Because if you start discrediting the illusion from people, then they'll start to say, well... Who cares about personal responsibility? Who cares about morality? Who cares about ethics? I'm working through my program. But then you have the question, well, what program are we in fact programmed into? And I was listening to this. The whole thing is good. It's worthwhile. It's only 13 minutes. But when he started with this metaphor, boy, he had my attention. So here we go. No, no, shoot them pretty darn well. So that story, even though it should unify us, it happens that there are a few holdouts and they're the most powerful people and that, you know, somehow keep this. Oh, let me, I can just, I, I paused it there. 802, okay. Room temperate, you know, they're fueled by some power station somewhere that has implications. So, you know, it is really us. It's the processes that we are depending on that we don't see day to day, but they're out there. Um, the other thing, and you know, and you you point to it. The, I think you called it the psychonaut route into that sort of unity. Involves an enlightenment, an awakening to a deep truth. And I, the analogy I use is this: if you discovered that you were a robot, and eh. now again, the materialists, should we tell people they're robots or not? Well, what if you discovered you're a robot? This is your awakening moment as a robot, realizing that from the singularity on, my destiny has been programmed by the laws of physics, and I am working out my program, and my conscious experience about choice is illusory. And that you were sent to, I don't know, assassinate some person who was innocent. If you discovered that that was the explanation for you, you would reject your program, right? You, as the robot that had been given decency in order to get by everybody so you could commit your assassination, would say, actually, I prioritize the values and I reject the mission that I've been sent on. That's who we are. We are that robot. We are on a genetic mission that is absolutely unacceptable. How would you just, how would you just succinctly define that genetic mission? That genetic mission is... Just propagation at all costs? propagation of your particular genetic spellings. And here's the key, it's a little subtle, but if you and I have different spellings for a particular, let's say a respiratory enzyme, and let's say that respiratory enzyme functions better in you than in me, it's 10% more efficient. My respiratory enzyme still wants your respiratory enzyme to go extinct because it doesn't care about the function. It cares that that spelling is advanced and your spelling is in conflict with my spelling. As long as yours is around, there will be fewer copies of mine. So our genomes are actually interesting. I mean, the, if I can just be clear about it, the mind fuck of the whole thing is that the entire evolutionary story is the cosmic spelling bee and it ends in genocide, right? Hmm. Once you realize that that's what you are, that you're built to advance your genetic spellings into the future generations, irrespective of what they spell, and that under circumstances like these, we can afford to be decent to each other, but if things were different, one of us would be putting the other in a gas chamber? No way. I want no part of that, and neither do you. So when people realize that that's really what they are, they are built to be nice when it makes sense to be nice, and they're built to be genocidal in circumstances when genocide is the thing, then the question is, well, all of the things that you actually value, how consistent are they with being that robot on that mission? So it sounds like you are sort of saying, at our root, we are nasty, brutish, and short, <laughs> right? That'd be the old selfish gene kind of thing, compared to some ascensionist or triumphalist. Clearly, you know, it's very prevalent in the self-help 
popular psychology space, we are on the frothy edge of, of, of the woo -woo edge, realizing our true natures as you know spiritual beings, blah blah blah. Um, is that something you don't hold out hope for? You feel like at root. Well, you know, and and here again, let's let's at some point, and and those of you who've been following my C.S. Lewis videos will know when I caught this, it's like, uh, Q.C.S. Lewis, right here. Where does this robot get this idea? Again, listen to him again. And you know, and you you point to it. Uh, I think you called it the psychonaut route into that sort of unity involves an enlightenment an awake where does this enlightenment come from where does this awakening come from getting to a deep truth and i where does this truth come from what thing is this truth i was listening to the jonathan peugeot talk to his brother last night and his brother made the great point which rupert sheldrake makes the same point that Materialist science does not have nested within itself its itself. In other words, you cannot account within materialism for the rules of physics that are supposed to govern it. There's no room for the rules of physics within the material universe because math does not exist. Well, well, they say, of course math exists. Of course logic exists. Of course the 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 laws of physics exist. We don't have a better word for law. Um, of course all of this exists, but no. But now, again, listen to him and think this through. I, the analogy I use is this. If you discovered that you were a robot and that you were... How would you discover this? With what mind would you discover this? And, well, we clearly have discovered this. Would we call this reason? I think reason is probably a pretty good candidate. Sent to... I don't know, assassinate some person who was innocent. If you discovered that that was the explanation for you, you would reject your program. Who is the you that rejects the program? I mean, what, what separation do we take to, I mean, if, if you were a robot programmed with this, surely the programmer would say, well, maybe we'd better not let the program have a degree of self-awareness and we and upon what basis would such morality now he hints at it a little bit into this right you as the robot that had been given decency in order to get by everybody so you could commit your assassination would say you were given decently so decency and so in other words program b is decency so that you don't just kill each other right away so so we play nice but we're the sneaky, subtle, assassin, spy robot infiltrator that worms into the relationship. And there's this, there's this story, it's in, it's in 1493, a book I've referred to before, where in fact, so you've got the, you've got the pilgrims and there's constant tension with the Indians that are there. And, and the Indians basically, the pilgrims are useful at first and and the pilgrims are hopelessly outmatched they don't know how to feed themselves but they do have guns and the indians have their own struggles with other tribes that are around and so and so the indians make a political calculation to keep them alive but the pilgrims well they keep dying really fast but they keep coming too but at some point one of the one of the one of the leaders of the Indians decides, okay, we've we've got to we've got to deal with these people, and so they have a very smart plan, which is make sure, you know, make sure you befriend everyone, so you can just drop in at people's houses and hang out with them, and so on and so forth. But then, at an appointed time, we are all going to rise up and kill your friends, so we can get rid of these people. I mean, this is the story. And this is what we're capable of. So again, listen to Brett Weinstein. Not only are we, um, not only are we like the robots in Terminator that want to kill people, we are like the flesh-covered robots in Terminator. But we're really sneaky ones that pass for family members so that we can murder them when they're easier to kill because they're unaware. This is us. Okay. So from what source do we derive this morality? Now pay attention, we just listened to Sam Harris and Bart Ehrman 
talk about oh, human, you know, human beings and animal sacrifices. We are so beyond that. That is so, that is so, that is so what? That is so 1900, that is so 1500, that is so zero, that is so 30 AD when Jesus dies on the cross, that is so 2000 BC when, when Abraham raises the knife over Isaac. Actually, I prioritize the values and I reject the mission that I've been sent on. How does the robot do this? Why would the robot do this? What is in the interest of the robot to reject his programming? And here's really the crazy thing. You've got two, I, I think this was taken at South by Southwest. You've got two high status, young, healthy, upwardly, probably upwardly middle or solidly middle or upwardly middle class, well-educated. These people are living some of the best lives that have ever been lived on planet Earth. And the biologist is saying, yeah, we're nice when we have a lot of things, but when things get tough, we turn on each other and become tribal and kill each other. So let's just decide not to do this. Okay, but what did you just say? You just said that when times are tough, this is how we act. So in other words, you're the sneaky robot who is feeling generous because you're not being threatened and you're saying to yourself, well, things are good right now, so I'm feeling generous. So I'm going to decide to hold on to my generosity so that even if times get bad, I'm going to keep being the generous robot. Well, what was your programming again? This, this thing blew me away on so many levels. And, well, I'm not just here to talk about this one. So then, at my meetup, oh, I had another great meetup on on Tuesday night. I, I I know it's really mean of me, and I'm trying to think about how we can maybe do some meetups online. But an online meetup would not be the same as, you know, not, now we're up to twice a month. Twice a month, getting together with some of the same people, and and I know it feels like church, because well, we get together in the same room and we talk, and the conversation is freewheeling, and you know. I'm amazed at the people we have in there and what they know. It's incredibly diverse. We've got some who are, you know, like the atheists, you know, or, or you know, Sam Harris fans, or, or, and and then some some Christians and some from other religions and some from no religion in particular and some anti-religious. But we have these amazing conversations. Anyway, I, I don't want to make you all envious. That doesn't serve me. But but someone mentioned the Dr. Drew. Um, ben Shapiro conversation, and I saw the Jordan Peterson one, and I made a video about that. And when I saw that he was interviewing Dr. Drew, I saw he interviewed uh, Dave Rubin, and I thought, wow, that's kind of what I expect. And then, but Dr. Drew, and I don't know a lot about Dr. Drew over the years. I've heard a couple of his podcasts or shows, and you know, when I think about Dr. Drew, I kind of think about. Dr. Oz or Oprah or Dr. Phil. I mean, he's kind of in that category for me. Uh, why on earth is Ben Shapiro talking to this guy? And then, I better pay attention in case I didn't get the link right when I set up the PowerPoint. But then, after the commercial break, he launches into Jordan Peterson and human sacrifice. And what he said, now I know through this conversation, a bunch of you are going to mention the um the oh the scapegoat guy i can't remember his name yeah i've listened to him a little bit um i'm not really an expert on him but let's let's listen to dr drew because what he said really took me by surprise so it's why i i know you just interviewed jordan peterson is why i love him so much because he he would not disagree with anything i've said so mm -hmm. far but he takes all of this into a sort of a deeper frame and he has a religious overlay to it, an anthropological overlay, and looks for the patterns of human behavior that are sort of reflective of what our neurobiology is. And um, what I was thinking about is uh, how we, we've sort of, I don't know why I'm jumping all the way to this, but I'm gonna go. <laughs> is we, we, we've, we've, missed, we've missed, in terms of understanding the human experience, we've become too relativistic in the sense that we just look at the superficial blush and not really ask the question of why do humans do that? What? Hmm. I would have loved to put him in the room with Sam Harris and Bart Ehrman and said, all right, I, I understand we're, we're sitting here and we've got an amazingly stable food supply 
and everyone in this room is is somehow earning middle class or upper middle class income we're all highly educated people if we want to play the social justice game we've all got white privilege um life is good okay life is good and oh i can't believe those old stories of human sacrifice and the barbarity and then brett weinstein comes along and Boy, we're looking at our old programming and say, boy, this old programming is immoral. So on one hand, well, thank goodness I've evolved and I'm sufficiently woke to, you know, know about my bad old selves and, oh, those old generations that somehow brought us here. And again, listen to uh, listen to Jonathan Peugeot talk about talk to his brother and his brother keeps saying, you know, I don't want to think that these old people were just immoral idiots. Yeah. Well, now, Dr. Drew, it's the psychologists that are getting us into this. This is so interesting. Dr. Drew comes along and says, yeah, yeah, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, we're all sitting here and we're evolved and socialized and we're all a little bit nervous about this culture war we're having right now. And, and people on the right are, are, are worried about the social justice warriors and people on the left are, are going absolutely crazy about Donald Trump. But... Is all that old stuff really beyond us and behind us? Didn't we just watch ISIS do some things that we thought we were done with as a people? And and now we're going to get condescending about the Muslims. And so Dr. Drew says, now no, let's pause. Let's think about this psychologically. And let's, let's ask some questions about, well, well why, why do we think this way about something that was simply taken for granted for most of civilized human history. And if you listen to Jordan Peterson, well, sacrifice. Why are they like that? Why, why do the Aztecs tear somebody's heart out and throw it down the stairs every morning? Oh, it's because the sun, they believe the sun would come. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> they, oh, okay, we can stop there then. As opposed to, Oh my God, this was a population that had something called a codex, which was a systematic way to create a warrior by abusing the crap out of children. I mean, vicious abuse. And when you take a bunch of people that are severely abused and you put them together, they have a hard time not acting their aggression out on one another. But if you focus that aggression out there mm -hmm. in somebody that you sacrifice every day, then there's this sort of a catharsis that goes on within the mob now we're okay today. We did it to that one. Now, watch how many Marvel movies where they're developing super soldiers. Well, the Aztecs did this. Well, how did the Aztecs do that? Well, abuse the heck out of children. Well, we abuse the heck out of children for, for, <laughs> for no nationalist reason at all. This is just what we do to children. Remember Bat, Pat Benatar's song, Hell is for Children? Uh, yeah, children, yeah, children, oh, this world. Dr. Drew is no idiot. Why did the Aztecs do this? Well, they're building soldiers. Why are they building soldiers? Why do they want super soldiers? Why do they want to dominate? Well, they want to dominate because the person on top of the hierarchy, the big monkey, the civilization that gets to dominate other civilizations, look at my last video, all that I talked about in terms of empire. If you're the empire, life is good. What did, what did Mel Brooks say? It's good to be king. Well, you know what? It's good to be emperor, and it's good to be in the empire. And I, I was I mentioned you before, before we started, before the cameras heated up, that I wanted to mention human sacrifice. And it, it, to me, it's an informative phenomenon about the human being that no one ever looks at, and it's in plain sight here at all times. And that is that if you look at every print of religion, you find human sacrifice, right? And it, it's always there, it's always around. And then, and then it sort of started, in, in Judaism, it started percolating over to, well, we'll have an animal substitute for the human. Yeah, that's right. And, but I mean, if you look at what Abraham, if people talk about the Abrahamic religion, what was Abraham doing when God sent the angel to, down to uh, grab his hand? He was going to sacrifice his son. He went to kill his son. It was even part of the ancient sacrifices that people did. And, and then some, some hallucination or whatever. So now Drew just kind of outs himself. So he's a modernist. He's a skeptic. He's a, you know, 
there isn't it isn't God that broke in. I mean, Peterson at least is an open agnostic. He leaves the door up open for God. Drew says, well, some hallucination or something, maybe something in our depth psychologist, our internal cloud of witnesses, our watchers, however you want to say. Well, what happens to Abraham? Came through to him and it changed everything in that moment. No more human sacrifice until evidently we started getting into it again with our aggressions. And then we decided, well, there's this one guy We'll kill this. This one guy died for us. And so now we don't have to do any more of that because we can focus on the one guy. We drink his blood, eat his flesh and stuff, and do these cannibalistic things that help us feel better. Whatever it is, deep in that is this primitive primate stuff that we never really look at. So the, so the real question becomes, okay. Okay. Now, now Shapiro... I mean, Drew just went all Christian on poor Ben. <laughs> so Ben wants to go back to the law, but it's but it's it's learning the rules and it's the law. And now, now Ben's a young guy, so I want to give him some slack. But um, it isn't just about rules. Rules administer a relationship. And and again, well, now we're setting up here because because I'm going to have you re-listen to Jordan Peterson's part three of his things because you listen to the relationship between rules. Well, rules are way down the system af after we have kind of conceptualized mentally, and then we we distill these things into rules and so on and so forth. But before that, long before that, we act these things out. Okay, so how did we get from there to here? Right, because of the, the, here being, the, the, here being a civilization where we oppose human sacrifice, for example, because there are... where we have rules against human sacrifice. We've learned to focus it and channel it in ways that have gotten us through periods of history where it could have been a problem. Right, but the, the, the real question is why in our particular civilization, for example. So, for example, I, I don't think that all civilizations have developed an aversion to human sacrifice quite to the same extent, obviously. An, an aversion to it? Yes. I mean, what's the aversion? People, people have a guy on a cross and they pray to it, and that's well, a I mean, sacrifice. Well, that's 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 a constant reminder of human sacrifice, right? But it's, it's not. In other words, she is saying, no, human sacrifice is in us all the time. In fact, well, what is a war? Isn't it? Um, it's them or us, so they're gonna die. Isn't every single war human sacrifice? Isn't the whole process of well, we're going to have animals instead. Well, let's say instead of nuking North Korea, we sent a virus over and killed all their farm animals. Now, you might say, well, that's terribly cruel. But you'd say, yeah, but it's a step up then from nuking them. Well, does, well, how does that sound? But it's not people who are saying that it is good to go out and, and participate no, in human sacrifice. They're no, saying the they opposite, deal with right? it by focusing on this one guy that did and, we sacrifice. And, the, but, and this, is, this is sort of the point that I'm trying to make, which yeah. is that the, the Judeo-Christian tradition yeah. in attempting to eradicate human sacrifice, yeah. right? The, the Bible is very harsh about human sacrifice. Yeah. It's one of the big things, and it's yeah. one of the big puzzles about Abraham. So the traditional Jewish read on that is that this was Abraham's struggle, is he's being told to do something he knows is immoral, because God has already told him it's immoral to do this. And Dr. Drew sitting there, wait, 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 wait. It's not about the rules. You're not understanding what I'm saying about how we are. Dr. Drew is saying, remember what Brett just said? No, no, we're not in that video. Paul Vanderclay is the author here. And Dr. Drew and Ben and Sam and Bart, they don't know about Paul, just like Frodo doesn't know about Tolkien. I am God in the box. Dr. Drew is trying to tell Ben, Ben, you're not getting it. It's not about, oh, this is what we did in order for our civilization to reach the peak, so we've got a rule, no human sacrifice. No, we sacrifice people all the time. We just do it in, in, in different ways. Um, a lot of, yeah, I've heard Tim Keller mention many times about, well, what is abortion? Well, this child is inconvenient. The, the, it's an inconvenient time in my life. Therefore, I will sacrifice the child for the sake of my career. We don't call that human sacrifice. It isn't ritualized. Well, actually, if you would, if you would go an ancient person time traveling into an abortion clinic, watching the sterilization procedures, the, the, the desk, the receptionist, the conversation, seeing how all of the practitioners, and this isn't just abortion, this is everything we do. Um, James K. Smith, Calvin College professor, contemporary liturgies, 
an ancient person try, time traveling into a doctor's office would say this all as cultic, all as religious. And we'd say, no, no, we're keeping away germs. Well, yeah, okay. Well, the ancient, um, the ancient Hebrew cleanliness laws, it wasn't about biology. It was about contamination and order. That's why we have rituals, and that's why when you go into the doctor's office, they're wearing a white coat, because the white coat are the vestments, the religious vestments of their holy order who are doctors, and you can no longer be a doctor if your order casts you out. Again, an ancient person coming to our society would say, you are very religious, and we say, we're not religious, and Dr. Drew here is saying, Human sacrifice is all over the place. We have just figured out a way to deal with it psychologically by having the cross, having the man on a cross. And if the man is on the cross, maybe I don't need to put my neighbor on that cross. Well, let's let Dr. Drew, he's being very patient here. He's, he's a little bit nicer of a, nicer of a guest than Jordan Peterson was. Thank and God so, he doesn't do it. That's all. And, I right, and then and then he and then he doesn't go ahead and do yeah. it, presumably because you know he's not supposed to do it, and God doesn't. So I have I have my own. No, 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 Ben, you don't get it. Own sort of understanding of that, a kind of Kierkegaardian understanding. But, but I'm, of how I'm that cool works, with but, theological interpretation, but the point is, there's an anthropological thing going on here too. Oh, there's no, no, is, no question, and so and it's deep, and right? It's profound. And, and the, the only point that I'm making is, we somehow got from people who sacrifice each other on the steps of yes. giant temples yes. to the place where we have such a, a, a innate now, almost innate, abhorrence yes. of, of this idea, yeah. but it didn't you know, take everywhere, right? Because the, no. because the fact is that there, you know, 70 years ago, there was a human sacrifice of literally tens of millions of human beings, and we were fine with that. One of the most controversial things that came up at the meetup is one of the, one of the people said, well, we like talking about the, the communist sacrifice and the and the nazi sacrifice well what about when we dropped the bombs well we had to do that because that saved that saved lives that saved american lives that saved suffering so in other words these people over here die so those people can live oh no 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 we don't we're we can just transcend our programming we can we can just forgive well what if let's say after okinawa we know that the 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 japanese regime was terribly fatigued and there were a number of people that were looking for a way to end the war we know that some of the similar things were happening in germany but they were having their internal political thing and well they have a problem how could they surrender and in a sense, America had a problem. Let's say after Okinawa, the Japanese said, let's have a truce. Let's stop the war. Let's have a conditional surrender. Well, was America going to take a conditional surrender after Pearl Harbor? No. Bart Ehrman says, why does a god need a sacrifice to forgive? Why did the Americans demand unconditional surrender of the Japanese after the sneak attack of Pearl Harbor where 2,000 some lost their lives? And then, of course, the bloodletting continued. The Japanese lost way more soldiers than the Americans in the Pacific campaign. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making a moral argument for or against the dropping of the atomic bombs. What I'm trying to illuminate is that what Dr. Drew is saying here is something far deeper than our contemporary woke pretense of, well, oh, I can just forgive my son. Yeah, he's your little boy. You love him. He's a child. What happens, there's another example that came up in the meetup, what happens when your wife kills your child? I can just forgive her. I sit around with people who regularly tell me I just can't forgive that for things way less than murder, for betrayals way more subtle, way more immaterial than theft. 
In fact, we are not ready to forgive people because of a look, because of our egos, because of our status, because of all of this. And we're sitting here saying pretentious things about human sacrifice. Dr. Drew is right. We have never lost human sacrifice. We practice it in every war. It gets practiced in every incidence of domestic abuse. It gets practiced in every child, in, in many, I won't say every, I'll say many forms of child abuse. Why, are, why do people abuse their children despite the significant biological instincts to love and protect those children? Why, are, why is love and violence so close together? But we're going to be flippant about these things? You're talking about genocide and how, you know, well, look, look at my theory. My theory would be that the reason that we're able to focus and not be that way is because of families, because, because our experience and development and our experience of self and other and the ability to develop, develop affect includes the experience of love. And ultimately, if we do enough connection with other people, we develop something called empathy. And with empathy, no way we're going to do stuff like that, right? And again, now my problem with brett dr brett dr drew because brett's a doctor too not just that kind of doctor but let's give him his doctor status title my issue with dr brett and dr drew is let's go back and listen to brett before we're all living in an enormously peaceful society an enormously affluent society and and many of us have all kinds of status and security and privilege <gasps> we do have it um compared to the vast majority of people who have ever lived on this planet, and even most of the people who are living in the world, not yet, we're always looking up at the people with more status and more money than us. But if you're listening to this video and you live a North American middle-class lifestyle or some kind of similar thing in other countries, you are in the top single digits percent in the world in all likelihood and yeah there's relative wealth blah 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 but but the point is we're the ones who have all of this comfort and security and so it's very easy for us to be generous and civil and kind what happens when someone breaks into your house well i want a gun why why do you want a gun uh, i want a gun for self-protection uh guns don't stop bullets Guns just give you the chance to shoot first, okay? That's the way in which guns protect. Dun guns protect by killing. They're not shields. We don't have a shield like in Dune. Right, so that's the, that's the highest order human development is, is deep empathy of other people, to be able to really appreciate other people's contents of their minds. If you're being traumatized and beaten or in war or you're living in you know horrible circumstances, you're gonna be prone to aggression. So how do, how do we balance these two? So, well, let's just stop it, according to Brett Weinstein. Well, can we? Now I wanna get I wanna play Jordan Peterson sacrifice. I'm gonna play the whole thing through. Okay. In fact, I'm gonna not even be in the little window here. I'm gonna go over there and read something because I've listened to this about three or four times in the last week. But as you're listening to it, I want you to listen for these things. Genesis 3, self-consciousness, death, the future. We find the future in the fruit and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. We discover the future and we discover death. The future is where we go to die. But then we learn delayed gratification and work and future. And this is all bound up with sacrifice, work, and future. Look at the way I laid this out on this page. Death, future, delayed gratification, work, future, sacrifice, work, future, sharing, future, social contract, persons, sharing, future, other persons. It's not a big leap to a God in the sky. What I'm doing with sacrifices, I'm bargaining with the future. I'm engaging with a transaction. And I'm hoping in this transaction is that not only do I eat 
mammoth today, I will eat mammoth tomorrow, because by virtue of my reputation, if I can gain reputation with this God, well, how can I gain reputation with this God? I'm going to give this God something. Well, how can I give something to the future? Well, I give something to the future by taking care of my children, and hopefully when I'm old, my children will take care of me when I can't hunt for myself and feed myself. And but, but it's way bigger than that. And so it's not a big leap to imagine that there's a God in the sky. And so listen to this whole thing, because part three is in some senses Jordan Peterson's argument for God. And I'm putting God in scare quotes, because what Peterson is saying here, again, he's an open agnostic. What he's saying here is that over a very long time, over all of this, we developed a functional God that we need. We have this functional God, and this functional God is deeply integrated into all of these systems that we have now stripped God out of. These imagination about the future, imagination about security, imagination about food. And, and so now we've built, well, some would argue that in many ways the state, now I'm going to get into political food fights, the state replaces God. Now, if you look at my last video, notice the, the rivalry between empire and God. Notice in the book of Daniel where the Son of Man comes with the clouds and he's given an eternal kingdom. And, and you have the vision of the, of, the, of the stone coming from the mountain and shattering the image, the image of the composite image. That's empire. It's the composite images in the book of Daniel. Shatters it, and that rock then becomes a mountain or a tree, and all the birds of the air nest in it. That's a picture of empire and civilization. And so it's God versus empire. It's God versus state. You know, when, a, when the American experiment tried to, we're going to, we're going to sacralize a process so that, and we're going to put God over here, and you can do whatever God things you want, and we're going to have the process over here and government over here. We're going to separate church from state. We're not really separating religion from state because we can develop all kinds of all kinds of religions, especially in the secular sphere, such as progressive liberationism, which John McWhorter just basically nails that. Well, this is a religion, it has an eschatology, it has all of these things, but we're not going to call it a religion because we're going to take God out of it. Uh, but Dr. Drew says, yeah, but this stuff is built into us. We, are, we have never stopped playing these games. We've only figured out how to sort these games through other symbolic methods, okay? So what you have here with Peterson's thing on sacrifices, in a sense, he's got the history of God and where God comes up from below. Now, we listen to this as secularized people and we say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can listen to Bart Ehrman say, yeah, we all know religion, miracles don't happen. And it's like, what percentage of the American population don't believe in miracles, really? 10, 15? What percent of the world's population don't believe in miracles? 3, 4? Max? Um, when you say nobody believes in miracles, who's nobody? Because just about everybody still does. Not you, not some of you listening to this. And then you might, you ask, well, why don't you believe in miracles? And, and what has happened to that really instinctive religious drives that pretty much common throughout humanity? Now, now, Dr. Drew says we've taken human sacrifice and we've ritualized it and we've embedded it into the system. And now Sam Harris and Bart Ehrman come and they chuckle and, oh, 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 oh those silly people who believe in religion and miracles and all of those things. And the psychologists come and say, yeah, but wait a minute, where has that gone in your life? What, what, what ways have you, what areas in your underground have you pushed that down into? Why is it the psychologist coming around and saying, you know, all this stuff that we thought we outgrew, Maybe we just dressed it up in different ways. Maybe we just acted out in different ways. Maybe we're believing our own elitist reputations of ourselves. 
Is that where it went? Part three is Jordan Peterson's argument for God. So to what degree is this real? Well, and this is where this section gets really interesting because Jordan Peterson will say, and listen for it, it, it comes kind of in the middle here. It worked. Bargaining with the future worked. Sacrifices worked. Now, Sam Harris and Bart Ehrman will say, no, we figured out it doesn't work, so we no longer do that. Okay, so you figured out that sacrificing animals to the gods no longer works, so... Oh, you might say, well, in what ways have you now changed this? Well, now we have retirement savings for the future. Now we pay taxes to the state. Well, wait a minute. If the state replaced gods and sacrifices were paid to the cult, then taxes are sacrifices and the state is God? I thought we separated church and state. Or maybe the state just replaced religion. Because, of course, and you'll hear segments of the Christian church say, the government shouldn't collect our taxes to pay welfare. The church should be doing that. And just about everybody else says, no, we'd rather have the government do that, because, yeah. But why are your church donations tax deductible? Where does that come from? Now, there's groups that are trying to stop that, but your donations to... The World Wildlife Fund are tax deductible. Your donations to, is Planned Parenthood a not-for-profit? They probably have a not-for-profit alongside. So what are, what, how are your donations to Planned Parenthood tax deductible? If you make a donation to an abortion clinic, are you practicing a modernist, replacement for child sacrifice because the person who is getting the abortion says that it's their career versus their child well didn't we don't we have careers so we don't need as many children see all these things run together and and we're we're sitting here saying no no we're way beyond all this child sacrifice stuff we don't have a god we have a state we don't have offerings we have taxes we don't have child sacrifice. We have two children instead of 12 children because we trust in the state and the taxes and our jobs to provide for our retirement years where we're no longer able to work. Although we're no longer working with our bodies, so we can in fact work longer because we don't break down as quickly as we used to. So is this any less religious than any of the other systems we've had before? To what degree is this real? Future, order, stability for work, sacrifice, delayed gratification becomes work. If you listen to section three, Peterson is basically saying, if you listen to it in the context of all these other things, we've just changed names on these things, but the whole thing is still the same. People discovered it works. It works with other people. That's because the future is so filled with people, Peterson will say. Yeah. So. Does it work with the future? And if we don't like what we're getting, seeing with different values changes the future. Because remember, you see what you want to see. And what you want to see grabs your attention and that focuses consciousness and the world that you actually see. And so I think part three is actually Jordan Peterson's argument for God. It's built into our actions as deeply as delayed gratification of work and the promise of reward with the social contract. What happens when you try to dispel it by calling it immoral or woo-woo or unreal? Well, where did, where did we begin to do this? Well, we've been doing it for a long time. Live for today. No future. Nihilism. Look at where Peterson starts the chapter. Do what's expedient. You lose meaning. So I'm going to play it. I'm going to disappear from my little window because I just listened to it. I've listened to it twice already today. I'm not going to break into it, but listen for all those things. And again, if you listen to this carefully, and if you want to go back and listen to it three or four times, every time you hear it, you will hear more, and you will begin to understand that this piece is in connection with Sam Harris and Bart Ehrman. It's in connection with 
Brett Weinstein talking about us as robots programmed, but we're going to change our programming. Dr. Drew saying, now we've never got beyond human sacrifice. We just process it in different ways. And Ben Shapiro is saying, well, that's a good thing. And yeah, it is a good thing. But again, when we decide that we are going to drone strike the terrorists so that they don't send suicide bombers into our buildings, isn't that kind of a form of human sacrifice? And you say, well, how did human sacrifice get going? Well, we pretty much figured, well, go back to Genesis 4. Listen to Genesis 4 in this thing. Listen to Peterson talk about Abraham and Jacob. And think about Drew and think about all of the things here. And yeah, so I'm just going to play the whole thing through. It's about 20 some minutes. Part three. Narratives and Sacrifice, from my new book, 12 Rules for Life. Rule 7, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Every man for himself, and the devil take the hindmost, as the old proverb has it. Why not simply take everything you can get whenever the opportunity arises? Why not determine to live in that manner? Or is there an alternative? And if so, why should we bother with it? Our ancestors worked out very sophisticated answers to such questions, but we still don't understand them very well. This is because they are in large part still implicit, manifest primarily in ritual and myth, and as of yet, incompletely articulated. We act them out and represent them in stories, but we're not yet wise enough to formulate them explicitly. We're still chimps in a troop or wolves in a pack. We know how to behave. We know who's who and why. We've learned that through experience. Our knowledge has been shaped by the interaction with others. We've established predictable routines and patterns of behavior, but we don't really understand them or know where they originated. They've evolved over great expanses of time but we didn't and still don't understand what it all meant. The biblical narrative of paradise and the fall is one such story, fabricated by our collective imagination working over the centuries. It provides a profound account of the nature of being and points the way to a mode of conceptualization and action well matched to that nature. In the Garden of Eden, prior to the dawn of self-consciousness, so goes the story, Human beings were sinless. Our primordial parents, Adam and Eve, walked with God. Then, tempted by the snake, the first couple ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, discovered death and vulnerability, and turned away from God. Mankind was exiled from paradise and began its effortful mortal existence. The idea of sacrifice enters soon afterward beginning with the account of Cain and Abel and developing through the Abrahamic adventures and the Exodus. After much contemplation, struggling humanity learns that God's favor could be gained and his wrath averted through proper sacrifice, and also that bloody murder might be motivated among those unwilling or unable to succeed in this manner. The Delay of Gratification When engaging in sacrifice, our forefathers began to act out what would be considered a proposition if it were stated in words, that something better might be attained in the future by giving up something of value in the present. Recall, if you will, that the necessity for work is one of the curses placed by God upon Adam and his descendants in consequence of original sin. Adam's waking to the fundamental constraints of his being, his vulnerability, his eventual death, is equivalent to his discovery of the future. The future. That's where you go to die. Hopefully not too soon. Your demise might be staved off through work, through the sacrifice of the now to gain benefit later. It is for this reason, among others no doubt, that the concept of sacrifice is introduced in the biblical chapter immediately following the drama of the fall there's little difference between sacrifice and work. 
They're also both uniquely human. Sometimes animals act as if they're working, but they are really only following the dictates of their nature. Beavers build dams. They do so because they are beavers. Beavers build dams. They don't think, yeah, but I'd rather be on a beach in Mexico with my girlfriend while they're doing it. Prosaically, such sacrifice, work, is delay of gratification, but that's a very mundane phrase to describe something of soul-shattering significance. The discovery that gratification could be delayed was, simultaneously, the discovery of time, and with it, causality, at least the causal force of voluntary human action. Long ago, in the dim mists of time, we began to realize that reality was structured as if it could be bargained with. We learned that behaving properly now, in the present, regulating our impulses, considering the plight of others, could bring rewards in the future, in a time and place that did not yet exist. We began to inhibit, control, and organize our immediate impulses so that we could stop interfering with other people and our future selves. Doing so was indistinguishable from organizing society. The discovery of the causal relationship between our efforts today and the quality of tomorrow motivated the social contract, the organization that enables today's work to be stored reliably, mostly in the form of promises from others. Understanding is often acted out before it can be articulated, just as a child acts out what it means to be mother or father before being able to give a spoken account of what those roles mean. The act of making a ritual sacrifice to God was an early and sophisticated enactment of the idea of the usefulness of delay. There is a long conceptual journey between merely feasting hungrily and learning to set aside some extra meat smoked by the fire for the end of the day or for someone who isn't present. It takes a long time to learn to keep anything later for yourself or to share it with someone else. And those are very much the same thing as in the former case you are sharing with your future self. It is much easier and far more likely to selfishly and immediately wolf down everything in sight. There are similar long journeys between every leap in sophistication with regards to delay and its conceptualization. Short-term sharing, storing away for the future, representation of that storage in the form of records and later in the form of currency, and ultimately the saving of money in a bank or other social institution. Some conceptualizations had to serve as intermediaries or the full range of our practices and ideas surrounding sacrifice and work and their representation could have never emerged. Our ancestors acted out a drama, a fiction. They personified the force that governs fate as a spirit that can be bargained with, traded with, as if it were another human being. And the amazing thing is that it worked. This was in part because the future is largely composed of other human beings, often precisely those who have watched and evaluated and appraised the tiniest details of your past behavior. It's not very far from that to God sitting above on high, tracking your every move and writing it down for further reference in a big book. Here's a productive symbolic idea. The future is a judgmental father that's a good start. But two additional archetypal foundational questions arose because of the discovery of sacrifice, of work. Both have to do with the ultimate extension of the logic of work, which is sacrifice now to gain later. First question, what must be sacrificed? Small sacrifices may be sufficient to solve small, singular problems. But it is possible that larger, more comprehensive sacrifices might solve an array of large and complex problems all at the same time. That's harder, but it might be better. Adapting to the necessary discipline of medical school will, for example, 
fatally interfere with the licentious lifestyle of a hardcore undergraduate party animal. Giving that up is a sacrifice. But a physician can, to quote George W., really put food on his family. That's a lot of trouble dispensed with over a very long period of time. So, sacrifices are necessary to improve the future, and larger sacrifices can be better. Second question, set of related questions, really. We've already established the basic principle. Sacrifice will improve the future. But a principle, once established, has to be fleshed out. Its full extension or significance has to be understood. What is implied by the idea that sacrifice will improve the future in the most extreme and final of cases? Where does that basic principle find its limits? We must ask to begin, what would be the largest, most effective, most pleasing of all possible sacrifices? And then, how good might the best possible future be if the most effective sacrifice could be made? The biblical story of Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's sons, immediately follows the story of the expulsion from paradise, as mentioned previously. Cain and Abel are really the first humans since their parents were made directly by God and not born in the standard manner. Cain and Abel live in history not in Eden. They must work. They must make sacrifices to please God, and they do so with altar and proper ritual. But things get complicated. Abel's offerings please God, but Cain's do not. Abel is rewarded many times over, but Cain is not. It's not precisely clear why, although the text strongly hints that Cain's heart is just not in it. Maybe the quality of what Cain put forward was low. Maybe his spirit was begrudging. Or maybe God was vexed for some secret reasons of his own. And all of this is realistic, including the text's vagueness of explanation. Not all sacrifices are of equal quality. Furthermore, it often appears that sacrifices of apparently high quality are not rewarded with a better future. And it's not clear why. Why isn't God happy? What would have to change to make him so? Those are difficult questions, and everyone asks them all the time, even if they don't notice. Asking such questions is indistinguishable from thinking. The realization that pleasure could be usefully forestalled dawned on us with great difficulty. It runs absolutely contrary to our ancient, fundamental animal instincts, which demand immediate satisfaction, particularly under conditions of deprivation, which are both inevitable and commonplace. And, to complicate the matter, such delay only becomes useful when civilization has stabilized itself enough to guarantee the existence of the delayed reward in the future. If everything you save will be destroyed, or worse, stolen, there's no point in saving. It is for this reason that a wolf will down 20 pounds of raw meat in a single meal. He isn't thinking, man, I hate it when I binge. I should save some of this for next week. So how was it that those two impossible and necessarily simultaneous accomplishments, delay and the stabilization of society into the future, could possibly have manifested themselves? Here is a developmental progression from animal to human. It's wrong, no doubt, in the details, but it's sufficiently correct for our purposes in theme. First, there's excess food. Large carcasses, mammoths or other massive herbivores might provide that. We ate a lot of mammoths, maybe all of them. With a large animal, there's some left for later after a kill. That's accidental at first, but eventually the utility of for later starts to be appreciated. Some provisional notion of sacrifice develops at the same time. If I leave some, even if I want it now, I won't have to be hungry later. 
That provisional notion develops to the next level. If I leave some for later, I won't have to go hungry, and neither will those I care for. And then to the next, I can't possibly eat all of this mammoth, but I can't store the rest for too long either. Maybe I should feed some to other people. Maybe they'll remember and feed me some of their mammoth when they have some and I have none. Then I'll get some mammoth now and some mammoth later. That's a good deal. And maybe those I'm sharing with will come to trust me more generally. Maybe then we could trade forever. In such a manner, mammoth becomes future mammoth, and future mammoth becomes personal reputation. That's the emergence of the social contract. To share does not mean to give away something you value and get nothing back. That is instead only what every child who refuses to share fears it means. To share means properly to initiate the process of trade. A child who can't share, who can't trade, can't have any friends because having friends is a form of trade. Benjamin Franklin once suggested that a newcomer to a neighborhood ask a new neighbor to do him or her a favor, citing this old maxim. He that has once done you a kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom you yourself have obliged. In Franklin's opinion, asking someone for something, not too extreme, obviously, was the most useful and immediate invitation to social interaction and trade. Such asking on the part of the newcomer provided the neighbor with an opportunity to show him or herself as a good person at first encounter. It also meant that the latter could now ask the former for a favor in return because of the debt incurred, increasing their mutual familiarity and trust. In that manner, both parties could overcome their natural hesitancy and mutual fear of the stranger. It is better to have something than nothing. It's better yet to share generously the something you have. It's even better than that, however, to become widely known for generous sharing. That's something that lasts. That's something that's reliable. And at this point of abstraction, we can observe how the groundwork for the conceptions reliable, honest, and generous have been laid. The basis for an articulated morality has been put in place. The productive, truthful sharer is the prototype for the good citizen and the good man. We can see in this manner how from the simple notion that leftovers are a good idea, the highest moral principles might emerge. It's as if something like the following happened as humanity developed. First, were the endless tens or hundreds of thousands of years prior to the emergence of written history and drama. During this time, the twin practices of delay and exchange begin to emerge slowly and painfully. Then they become represented in metaphorical abstraction as rituals and tales of sacrifice told in a manner such as this. It's as if there's a powerful figure in the sky who sees all and is judging you. Giving up something you value seems to make him happy. And you want to make him happy because all hell breaks loose if you don't. So practice sacrificing and sharing until you become expert at it and things will go well for you. No one said any of this at least not so plainly and directly, but it was implicit in the practice and then in the stories. Action came first, as it had to, as the animals we once were could act but could not think. Implicit, unrecognized value came first, as the actions that preceded thought embodied value but did not make that value explicit. People watched the successful succeed and the unsuccessful fail for thousands and thousands of years. We thought it over. 
and drew a conclusion. The successful among us delay gratification. The successful among us bargain with the future. A great idea begins to emerge, taking ever more clearly articulated form in ever more clearly articulated stories. What's the difference between the successful and the unsuccessful? The successful sacrifice. Things get better as the successful practice their sacrifices. The questions become increasingly precise and simultaneously broader. What is the greatest possible sacrifice? For the greatest possible good? And the answers become increasingly deeper and profound. The God of Western tradition, like so many gods, requires sacrifice. We've already examined why. But sometimes he goes even further. He demands not only sacrifice, but the sacrifice of precisely what is loved best. This is most starkly portrayed and most confusingly evident in the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, beloved of God, long wanted a son. And God promised him exactly that after many delays and under the apparently impossible conditions of old age and a long barren wife. But not so long afterward, when the miraculously born Isaac is still a child, God turns around and in an unreasonable and apparently barbaric fashion demands that his faithful servant offer his son as a sacrifice. The story ends happily. God sends an angel to stay Abraham's obedient hand and accepts a ram in Isaac's stead. That's a good thing. But it doesn't really address the issue at hand. Why is God's going further necessary? Why does he, why does life impose such demands? We'll start our analysis with a truism. Stark, self-evident, and understated. Sometimes things do not go well. That seems to have much to do with the terrible nature of the world, with its plagues and famines and tyrannies and betrayals. But here's the rub. Sometimes when things are not going well, it's not the world that's the cause. The cause is instead that which is currently most valued subjectively and personally. Why? Because the world is revealed to an indeterminate degree through the template of your values. Thus, if the world you are seeing is not the world you want, it's time to examine your values. It's time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. It's time to let go. It might even be time to sacrifice what you love best so that you can become who you might become instead of staying who you are. There's an old and possibly apocryphal story about how to catch a monkey that illustrates this set of ideas very well. First, you must find a large, narrow neck jar, just barely wide enough in diameter at the top for a monkey to put its hand inside. Then you must fill the jar part way with rocks, so it is too heavy for a monkey to carry. Then you must scatter some treats, attractive to monkeys, near the jar to attract one, and put some more inside the jar. A monkey will come along, reach into the narrow opening, and grab while well, the grabbing's good. But now he won't be able to extract his fist, now full of treats, from the jar. Not without unclenching his hand not without relinquishing what he already has. And that's just what he won't do. The monkey catcher can then walk over to the jar and pick up the monkey. The animal will not sacrifice the part to preserve the whole. Something valuable given up ensures future prosperity. Something valuable sacrificed pleases the Lord. What is most valuable and best sacrificed? Or what is at least emblematic of that? A choice cut of meat, the best animal in a flock, a most valued possession. 
What's above even that? Something intensely personal and painful to give up. That symbolized, perhaps, in God's insistence on circumcision as part of Abraham's sacrificial routine, where the part is offered symbolically to redeem the whole. What's beyond that? What pertains more closely to the whole person rather than to the part? What constitutes the ultimate sacrifice for the gain of the ultimate prize? It's a close race between child and self. The sacrifice of the mother offering her child to the world is exemplified profoundly by Michelangelo's great sculpture, the Paeda. Michelangelo crafted Mary cradling the nearly naked body of her adult son, crucified and ruined. It's her fault. It was through her that he entered the world and its great drama of being. Is it right to bring a baby into this terrible world? Every woman asks herself that question. Some say no, and they have their reasons. Mary answers yes, voluntarily, knowing full well what's to come, as do all mothers if they allow themselves to see. It's an act of supreme courage when it's undertaken voluntarily. In turn, Mary's son, Christ, offers himself to God and the world to betrayal, torture, and death, to the very point of despair on the cross where he cries out those terrible words from Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the archetypal story of the man who gives his all for the sake of the better, who offers up his life for the advancement of being, who allows God's will to become manifest fully within the confines of a single mortal life. That is the model for the honorable man. In Christ's case, however, as he sacrifices himself, God, his father, is simultaneously sacrificing his son. It is for this reason that the Christian sacrificial drama of son and self is archetypal. It's a story at the limit where nothing more extreme, nothing greater can be imagined. That's the very definition of archetypal. And that's the core of what constitutes religious Pain and suffering define the world. Of that, there can be no doubt. Sacrifice can hold pain and suffering in abeyance to a greater or lesser degree. And greater sacrifices can do that more effectively than lesser. Of that, there can be no doubt. Everyone holds this knowledge in their souls. Thus, the person who wishes to alleviate suffering who wishes to rectify the flaws in being, who wants to bring about the best of all possible futures, who wants to create heaven on earth, will make the greatest of sacrifices of self and of child, of everything that is loved, to live a life aimed at the good. He will forego expediency. He will pursue the path of ultimate meaning. And he will, in that manner, bring salvation to the ever desperate world. Part four. Okay. What strikes me about the modernist critique and incredulity of, let's say, the conversation that Harris and Ehrman have is, is just, it's naive and it's puffed up. Look at what forgiveness really involves. C.S. Lewis had a great line about forgiveness. Everybody thinks forgiveness is a great idea until they have something to forgive. Because what real forgiveness usually involves means that you or something you love or something you value has, is threatened or wounded or hurt or destroyed. How will you act in the future towards that person? It is really hard. It is a big question. And in fact, most common ethics and morals say you have to secure justice, you have to hit back, 
you have to make the world right again at the expense of your neighbor. Now, Peterson talks about Cain and Abel. Peterson doesn't finish the story, so I'm going to read some of it. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your, blother, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, Bart Ehrman says, why can't God just forgive him? What does it mean that Abel's blood cries out from the ground? Is that a metaphor? Does God... How does God experience the death of each of us? If you look at those early chapters of Genesis before the flood, God experiences pain because of our violence towards one another. The blood of Abel cries out from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opens up its mouth to receive your, blother, your brother's blood from your hand. In other words, the ground is now your enemy. Now, let's imagine you are someplace and some murderer kills people and you get splattered with their blood. Do you wear it? What do you think? How do you feel towards the murderer? Even if you are just splattered with your blood, with their blood, is your ego wounded? Do you send them the dry cleaners bill because of the stains? Do you, in fact, suffer trauma? And then maybe take the person to court. And when, when they are tried, you appear before the judge and say, I have been wrong too. The fabric of shalom has been rent. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Now this is very interesting because remember the story begins with Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, and her... The curse that's connected with her is pain and childbearing. The curse that's connected with him is pain in tilling the soil. And in fact, in Genesis 3, the language is highly parallel between the curse to the man and the curse to the woman. That the, his means of production, his means of life, are going to be fraught with frustration and struggle. And her means of protection, her capacity for fruitfulness, will also be marred by, by frustration and struggle. Now, with taking evil further, the ground will no longer yield to Cain. Well, what is Cain going to do? What can Cain do? He, he is cut off. The land will no longer yield him fruit at all. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Now, again, if you look at Jordan Peterson's term, so what has happened to Cain? Well, now he has a reputation. Well, what is a reputation? A reputation is a mark in the fabric of society. And everyone will know that Cain is a murderer. And no one will be able to trust Cain. And no one will want to do business with Cain. And Cain will no longer be able to be fruitful. And so he says, my mark is, my my." Punishment is too much for me. Today you are driving me from the land. It will no longer produce for me, and I will be hidden from your presence. Well, what does that mean? Remember how this whole thing got started with sacrifice, and Cain's offering was rejected. Now, in an upcoming video, I'm going to talk about the symbolism of sacrifice, because it actually makes a world of sense, but we're fairly blind to it. You are driving me from the land. I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. Well, why will they kill him? Because they will do justice. They will do justice and they will kill him because he must die for what he did to his brother. There's no trite forgiveness here. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Well, what does that mean? That means that the Lord is going to protect this murderer. Hmm. Well, how do we feel about that? Is that something God should do? Should God take his life? We're very quick often to wade in with judgments about things and relationships that, that we know very little about. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now the story continues. Cain made love to his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city. Why was he building a city? Well, what couldn't he be? Couldn't be a farmer. Now he's going to be a businessman. 
Now he's going to be a politician. And he called it after his son Enoch. Enoch was born, to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad was the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, polygamy. Gave birth, um, married two women. One was named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabel. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. The earth is still not producing for them, is it? His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who played stringed instruments and pipes. Zillah was also the father of Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me. Hmm. What has happened? Well, it's an eye for an eye, a wound for a wound. And actually, when we look at an eye for an eye, an eye for an eye, and this is a, this is a law that's beyond Israel. You'll find it in Hammurabi's Code. You'll find it in other, other ancient Near East codes. The purpose of the law is to limit retribution. So if someone hurts you, you may only hurt them to the degree that you've been hurt. If they steal a cow from you, you must replace, well, actually in the law, you must replace them with multiple cows to make restitution. But it's to limit retribution, an eye for an eye. It's not a life for an eye. Why? Why? Well, what did... Brett Weinstein just say about us. What are we? We're sneaky assassin robots that play nice to infiltrate the village so we can get people when they're unaware. Oh, we're looking at ourselves. Oh, I don't want to be that. I want to be nice. I want to be good. Well, are we trying to be nice and good so that we can infiltrate the village? I thought that's our programming, right? That's program B. Program A is when the chips are down, if it's me versus them, it's going to be them. I have wounded, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech 77 times. But who's avenging for Lamech? Lamech's avenging for himself. Great scene at the beginning of The Godfather. You can find it on YouTube. I'm not going to put it here because probably the studios will have YouTube take down my video. The, but the Godfather begins the story and, and, and a man from the community comes in and, and someone has, someone has um, abused his daughter and he's furious. And this is the Godfather's wedding day, and he cannot deny a request made on his daughter's wedding day. So the Godfather has this amazing speech. You've never invited me to your home for coffee. You didn't want to associate with me. I'm not dumb, the Godfather says to him. I understand that I'm a persona non grata. Here you've come to this country, and you have laws and courts, and you don't need me like in the old country. You show no respect. You come into my house, and you ask me to murder for money. Your daughter has been mistreated, and you want the young man's life. And the guy says, I want justice. And the Godfather, the mob boss, this man who trades in personal debts and vendettas says, You do not ask for justice. Your daughter is still alive. I want him to suffer. How can I pay you? Yeah. Forgiveness is just something we do. Yeah. We look at our programming and say, I don't want to be that way. Yeah, this is the thing that those of us who are living pretty nice lives say. We imagine ourselves in comfortable conditions and we think, I would do better. And we sit in judgment over characters we watch in the movies, over characters we watch in books, and we sit in judgment over God and we say, no, I would be above it all. Yeah, right. Look at humanity's track record. So tell me again about progress and enlightenment and just choosing a different program. 
Trump threatens North Korea with fire and fury. Trump to Kim Jong-un, my button's bigger. This is the game we play. This is how the world works. If you don't play this game, you lose. In fact, you lose your stuff, you lose your respect, you lose your reputation, you lose your life. What is the Christian story? Why do we try to put God or history or reality in our debt? Why do we practice sacrifice? Because that's what sacrifice is about. It's about trying to put God in our debt. Why do we share the mammoth? We're trying to put our neighbor in our debt. We're trying to enhance our reputation. Because it works. It works with our neighbor sometimes. And if it doesn't work with our neighbor, we call that person dishonorable. Does it always work? You tell me that. Usually we default to it's him or me, and if I decide to share with my neighbor, it's because I want to eat in the future. Do we call that goodness? Do we call that morality? Is that really generosity? Or are we willing to sacrifice the other, or the few, or the one, for the good of the many? Recently I read a thing on the Marvel Universe, and, and these are some of the issues going through Infinity Wars. We're still telling God stories. We're still telling superhero stories. We're still working the Greek mythology. Again, see the, the massive videos I put out on Tuesday on this. In our opinion, from our perspective, we are the choosers of good. We decide when it's justice, when something needs to be done. We decide, no, it's a life for an eye. Or rather, it's a life for a reputation. In the Christian story, the God offers his son as a sacrifice, but unlike in Abram's case, he doesn't withhold the knife. The son offers himself to God. And you'll notice in the Christian story that it keeps getting worked both ways. Is Jesus a victim? Yes. Does Jesus do this willingly? Yes. Does Jesus pray in the garden? May the cup pass from me? Yes. Does Jesus look for a way out when he could have easily talked his way out of this injustice and he remains silent with Pilate? Pilate's looking for a trick or a bribe. Herod's looking for a little miracle. This week I'm preaching on Last week I preached on Elisha and the Aramean raiding party. This week Ben Hadad has surrounded Samaria and cannibalism is being practiced and the king says it's God's fault. Let's go kill Elisha. And does Elisha blind the king's soldiers to save himself? No. Does he offer himself willingly? No. He holds the door. It's complicated. What's the Christian story? God offers his son, yes. The son offers himself to the God, yes. Christus Victor. What Bart Ehrman said is true. Theologians have never stopped talking about the atonement and trying to find theological reasons to express this. There's a very interesting line in the New Testament where basically the Apostle Paul says that angels never... Their epi the epithumia of angels, the overwhelming desire of angels, is to keep looking into this mystery. It's like it's this fascinating thing that keeps our attention and our watchers can't figure it out, so we keep looking at it. That's the atonement. That's what's central here. And Dr. Drew says we've never gotten beyond it. This is part of the reason why we don't kill each other. And it's not just because... Oh, we saw this, now we have a rule. Really? That's how human beings work? When there's a rule, we don't break it? That would make my job a lot easier. I could stand up in church and say, follow the rules. I don't. I'm a Christian minister. What does that mean? You're rule breakers. I know you. Why do I know you're rule breakers? Because I'm one too. We're all rule breakers. I'm a Calvinist. Total depravity. Well, what can God do with rule breakers? Well, it has to be something more than giving us rules. In the Noah flood, the, the strategy is kill all the bad people because we imagine there's good people and bad people. So let's kill the bad people and the world will be fine. Great. How does it work? It doesn't. 
The line between good and evil runs through every human heart. Solzhenitsyn. So now we'll make rules and we'll enforce them. This is the strategy of the state. Okay? I talked before about God and state. This is the strategy of the state. Make laws and enforce them. Does this work? Yes, to a degree. You can gain compliance. You can gain a degree of mastery over people, but it requires that you keep pressing the law on them. What is it insufficient to do to change our hearts? Fulfilling compliance with the law is not generosity. What is the Christian story? The God gives his son. That's generosity. The son gives himself. That's generosity. Sacrifice, but it's not a transactional sacrifice as such. It's got that layer to it too, but it's got additional layers. The son offers himself to God. He offers himself as a gift. Do you wish to accept it? Why doesn't the man invite the godfather to the house? He doesn't want to be indebted to the godfather. Now he wants the young man who roughed up his daughter or raped his daughter. It's not really clear. It's probably rape. Now he wants him killed. Well, the godfather's going to send his, his boys there to beat that young man up. But then the godfather says, there will come a day. When I need a favor, and I'll look to you. It's exactly what the man was avoiding. Why was the man avoiding it? Because he knows that he knows the character of the Godfather and what the favor will cost. Is this what God does? Misery, deliverance, gratitude. You can see it in almost all my sermons. Jesus gives his life, and he doesn't say, Here are the conditions. Here is the contract. Read the story of Jacob. God comes to Jacob in a dream at Bethel. Jacob has his head down, and God says, I'm going to make you a great nation. It's a gift. And Jacob wakes up and says, if you do, I'll give you 10%. Jacob takes a gift and turns it into a contract. Jesus comes and says, here is my gift. What will you do with it? Well, what will you do with it? Well, now suddenly it's on you. It's not law. He's not saying, if you obey me, I'll reward you with heaven. That's almost always what Sam Harris sees in this. That's not the gospel. The, God, the Bible is not a book of rules that God says, if you follow the rules, I will reward you. There is certainly reward in keeping the rules. The state knows that. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is, Jesus comes and says, you're hopelessly lost. You cannot save yourself. I will give myself for you. What will you do? Well, what will you do? What should you do? Are you afraid that accepting it puts you in his debt? How could such a debt be paid? Well, it can't be paid. That's the problem. Well, you say, well, that can't be right. Well, let me ask you this. Your parents gave you life. That can be construed as a debt. How can that debt be repaid? Well, I can love my parents. Well, that's good. Well, I can care for my parents in their old age. Well, that's good. Is that repayment of the debt? No, the debt can't be paid because there's nothing you can give to your parents that would be comparable to what they gave to you. Now, if you listen to this, uh, what's his name? The, the guy who says we shouldn't bring children into the world? Well, he says... We're giving them a we're giving we're giving the children a debt. Well, anyway. It's archetypal. You can't get beyond it. Accepting the gift means entering in to the life of the gift and the way of life of the giver. You see, what happens is that one way to understand what Christianity is is you see you've been given a gift. Watch Saving Private Ryan. Tom Hanks, his last dying breath, what does he say to Matt Damon? Earn it. Christ doesn't even say that. He says, here's my gift. And you say, well, Andre Crouch, how can I give thanks for the things you have done for me? Can't repay this gift. Well, how then might I voluntarily want to live my life? 
Well, what happens when we see something beautiful, when we see something noble? What happens when we see the greatest example of what the world should be like? We want to emulate it. We want to be like it. We want to do it. The Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and says, be like him. Jesus says, I will give you my spirit so that you can live my life. Well, well, what does Jesus' life look like? Elijah, Elisha doesn't do a miracle to save himself. Jesus doesn't do a miracle to save himself. He lives your well-being at my expense. That's what he does. So live it out, your well-being at my expense. Won't this get you what it got Jesus? Yes. When you turn the other cheek, what happens in this world? You get hit again. Yes. What does Steve Martin say? What do the meek get? The meek get the short end of the stick. Yes. Jesus says, if you live like me, you will die like me, and you will live again like me. And you say, well, I'd rather, I'd rather live the way of the world. Yeah. Is Brett Weinstein true, right? Yeah. We are assassin robots. And we play nice games, but now Brett Weinstein says, well, I want to be better than the assassin robot. Where does he get this idea from? He's not a Christian. Why does Jordan Peterson call these atheists Christians? Uh, the unbelievable conversation is coming out. I'm looking forward to that. Um, Justin Brierley is teasing us on this. Can I choose to be Lamech? Would I rather be Lamech? We say, well, it's safer to be Lamech because I have a big bad reputation. Nobody crosses the Godfather because they're afraid of him. How, do we, how does this work in national politics? We've got all the nukes, North Korea. Go ahead. My button's bigger than yours. That's the way the world works. But which neighbor would you rather have? You might say, well, I want to live next to the Godfather because nobody's going to rob my house. Okay, but don't you really want the neighbor who's going to take in your mail and watch out for you? Not because I took in your mail. You owe me a favor. There'll come a day when you say, Godfather, I need some help and I'll help you. But there'll come a day when I need a favor from you. It's not what Jesus does. Why reprogram the robot? Because we've seen Jesus. Out of pride? Because I want to be a good person? That's the robot's programming to get in better with the others. Is it better to be good or alive if you're a materialist? Well, following Jesus makes no sense if you're a materialist. Oh, it's noble. Oh, you'll have a nice reputation. After you're gone, people will, you, will, will say nice things of you. That's the Greek strategy for eternal life, that your story will live on in the story of the ages. Achilles is therefore a god, as is Odysseus, sort of. But we're dead. We're in the big sleep. We're not even in Sheol or Hades. Don't you think it's good to sacrifice yourself for the sake of others? Yeah, all of our movies have that as good. Isn't that... What we see in almost every movie, Neo sacrifices himself and he rises again. Movie after movie, Harry Potter sacrifices himself and he rises it again. He rises again. You can't kill this story and you don't want to. And Jordan Peterson says, you're all a bunch of Christians. And we say, no, I'm not. You go to the movies. You love Harry Potter. You never listen to Nietzsche. And we say, yeah, great strategy, Christian, you go first, which is exactly what Jesus does. Jesus says, I'm going first. I'm going first. I'm giving my life for you, and my Father will raise me. And you say, okay, but if I do it too, will I be raised? Oh, no, it's a metaphor. No, I don't want, I'm not going to give my life for a metaphor. Yeah. It's complicated. It keeps twisting down, doesn't it? Imagine there's no heaven. Well, 
if there's no heaven, how will that impact my robot programming? Can't I just say, I'm the assassin robot. Isn't this how I've been programmed? You've not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further would be spoken to them? Read Exodus 20. Because they could not bear what was commanded. They couldn't bear the law. Why? Because we don't like the law. Why? Because our hearts are hard and, okay, we have a rule, no human sacrifice. Fine. But if the baby is an inconvenience or the spouse is an inconvenience, divorce her. Or the disabled child is an inconvenience, or, or, or anything is an inconvenience because I am the little center of the universe. Well, what happens if you're the inconvenience? Well, then suddenly it's human sacrifice. It's me or them. Because they could not touch what was commanded. Even if an animal touched the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Are your symbolic senses tingling? You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Joyful assembly, not compliance. Oh, we got to show up to, ch to sing for God again. To the church of the firstborn. The firstborn of what? The firstborn of the dead. Whose names, are writ whose names are written in the in heaven, who have come to God, the judge of all, the spirit of righteousness made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Not the covenant of animals, not the covenant of legal compliance, a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Well, what did the blood of Abel speak? The blood of Abel cried out for justice. My brother killed me. Kill him back. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word. He died because I'm a killer. I live because he was sacrificed. What does that make me want to do? How does that make me want to live? That's the gospel.